We are delighted tonight to welcome Susan De Freitas. Susan is an author, editor, educator, and her work has been featured in over 30 magazines, journals, and anthologies, including Nervous Breakdown, Story Magazine, and the City of Weird Anthology, which has been one of our uh, past bestsellers uh, all throughout Christmas. She is here tonight to talk about her debut novel, Hot Season. It's a story of idealism, activism, deception, and the FBI set down in the Southwest. The Arizona Daily Sun calls it a brisk read with a potent mix of wit and edge. Portland's very own Monica Drake, author of Clown Girl, The Stud Book, and The Folly of Loving Life, says, it's a beautiful book that asks the crucial question, is it worse to destroy a dam or destroy a river? Which is to say, how do we live our conscience on a crowded, corrupted planet? Another local great, uh, Carrie Luna, Oregon Book Award winning author of The Revolution of Every Day, says, hot season explores the charged, the charged terrain where the youthful search for identity meets environmental activism and the romantic, illicit lure of direct action, a compelling book. You know, every local author has blurbed this book. I think um, there's nothing more telling than that because usually when, if an author doesn't like a book, they get to make an excuse like, oh, I've been writing, I didn't get to read it. They keep quiet. So when people speak up and say uh, they love a book, I think it's, it's very notable. So with that in mind, please welcome Susan DeFratis. <laughs> inauguration of the uh, surveillance state and sweeping anti-terrorism laws that we have now come to uh, think of as rather commonplace, maybe. We've become rather complacent about, and which is now about to fall into the hands of a man who has clearly demonstrated that he is not worthy of our trust. A man who has clearly demonstrated that he will use whatever means are at his disposal to retaliate against those who criticize him, uh, who exercise the First Amendment rights um, in dissent, and those who uh, oppose his policies. So in the face of that, in the face of the threat that is coming 
coming down on the sort of people that I wrote about, um, on those fighting for environmental, economic, and social justice, um, there's a sense of great urgency, right? There's this sense that just kind of being an armchair activist, the way I have certainly been, and maybe some of you have been as well, who you know, kind of sign a lot of petitions online and maybe donate some money here and there to, um, to nonprofit groups, that that is no longer adequate, right? Um, and, and that real action needs to be taken for those of us who have fought for an envelope, for a stamp. Uh, and, you know, along with that sense of urgency towards action, there's a feeling that, you know, making art is kind of a self-indulgent thing, right? Especially like writing fiction. So it, re it really requires a long time. I don't know if you, if you guys are aware of this. It takes a long time to make. Um, and, and in many ways, it seems far removed um, from actually moving mass and energy but at the same time, part of what, part of why that poem resonates so deeply for me in regard to this work is because it reminds me that the, the artist is not just in conversation with the present moment. The artist is in conversation with the future. The artist is involved in the process of creating artistic documents, right? It's a kind of time travel. And, um, it is, that's why we're watching the skies like a spy, right? For the intersection of a planet and the future. In some ways, uh, uh, acts of imagination and fiction can help to influence the future maybe, but in other ways, they are a message in a box, right? And it is my hope that this novel, which is set in the recent past, not only reflects on the present moment, but uh, is a message in the bottle to a future where these kinds of conversations, this kind of resistance, uh, makes a difference and helps to turn the wheel. So. Number one, thank you to Monica Drake and Carrie Luna, who are tonight at Dear Sugar Radio, Writers Resist, wish that I could be there. I thank all of you for, I guess, choosing to be here rather than there. Although it is sold out, so maybe this was, you know, your second choice. It's okay, I forgive you. Um, Monica and Carrie are two local writers whose work I admire so much, and they're agreeing to blurb this book, to put their name on it, to put their name behind mine. Early on in this process, it made me feel so much better uh, about my odds going into this process. So thank you to them. Um, I want to say thank you to a former skateboard punk who now reviews books uh, for Read It Forward at the New York Times Book Review, among other places. His name is Jonathan, Jonathan Russell Clark. And I want to say thank you to him uh, for reviewing my book for putting it on a shelf with six other debut authors who are way above my pay grade, calling it an auspicious debut, earth-shatteringly good, um, and also noticing the veracity of, of my details with regard to the alternative culture environments that this book takes place in. Um, I so appreciate somebody noticing that. And I also have to say that um, somebody, for as both an author and an editor, for somebody to call your book like as if Donna Tart had been edited by Gordon Lish, <laughs> it's just astounding, right? I mean, probably I can't imagine anything anybody ever saying anything better to me in my life. So, thank you. Um, I want to say thank you to Kevin Samsel, that tireless advocate of the small press literary culture and local authors here in Portland, without whom I would certainly not be standing here today. I want to say thank you also to Diana Hewley, uh, also here at Powell's, who, you know, she made my book a staff pick here at Powell's, uh, like a recommended gift for the holidays. And she put it, I don't know if you saw this end cap, 
downstairs in the blue room. I think it's shifted around a bit recently. But this end cap of Pacific Northwest um, authors, like what an incredible thrill to find my book on the same shelf with like adolescent idols of mine, like uh, Ursula Le Guin and Tom Robbins and Ken Kesey. Uh, to my husband, Daniel Timmons, who is not only like a tireless cheerleader through this whole process, um, but he's also, he's a great technical editor for this book. He found all kinds of things that many, many other people miss. So um, thanks for that. When Katie met Huckleberry, he was juggling on the curb at the end of Second Street with a rose between his teeth. In that dented bowler hat, busted out corduroy vest, and those dirty car hearts, held together by nothing more, it seemed, than the patches attached to them. He looked like some handsome sideshow hobo, circa 1920, which is to say he looked like Katie's future bohemian lover. She sidled up beside him, cast him what she hoped was a scandalous glance, and said, boy, did you run away with the circus? He smiled, revealing a slight gap between two front teeth. Katie had always dreamed of having a bohemian lover, not a boyfriend. She'd had a number of those, but a lover. The kind of person artists and revolutionaries casually introduced to friends at parties, and not the kind of wannabe frat parties that had characterized her high school years in the White Mountains, but rather the kind where beautiful people wearing nothing but various shades of bright acrylic paint might discuss the failures of some noted political theorist while passing around the split the way they did in Europe. <laughs> Katie had assumed that any institution of higher ed offering such courses as Chomsky, Manufacturing Dissent, and Ecological Issues in Site-Specific Dance would pretty much guarantee her entree into such a scene. But during her first month at Deep Canyon College in Crest Top, Arizona, she'd encountered nothing more than your run-of-the-mill college keggers and potlucks in crappy houses, such as this one here at the end of Second Street, where some unfortunate furniture had been hauled out in the front yard. The boy launched two juggling pins up overhead, caught them behind his back with one hand, and then tossed the third and final pin high in the air. It flashed yellow-green through the cloudless blue and landed on his outstretched foot, stalled miraculously on his big toe. His feet were filthy. Somehow even that seemed charming. <laughs> you know, she told her boho bo, I've always wanted to learn how to juggle. Juggling until that very moment had fallen somewhere between spelunking and chinchilla breeding in terms of Katie's general interests. But this boy 
Boy was so intent on what he was doing, so deeply into it, that she wanted to be into it too. He plucked the rose from between his teeth, holding it lightly between two fingers. There's a show tonight, he told her, a benefit for the green. You should come. Where at? He lifted his chin as if this was a given. The black cat. What was the green and why did it need benefiting? And where exactly was the black cat? Before Katie could embarrass herself by asking or perhaps embarrass herself further as she probably had fits of baba ganoush from lunch gummed up between her teeth, she spied the sign beside them half hidden by the weedy trees. The black cat was this house here at the end of Second Street, beside the entrance to the bike trail that ran along the creek. Cool, she said, in a manner intended to convey the same. I'm Katie, by the way, Huckleberry. Huckleberry held that long stemmed rose for a moment. His wrist turned elegantly out, and for a moment she thought he might present it to her or at least extend his hand. Instead, he tucked the rose into his breast pocket and winked, or perhaps just blinked. <laughs> <laughs> then he kicked the pin on his foot high overhead and started the same routine all over again.